thanks to the Foundation Studio to bring ourselves into a much wider world. We're joined today by Mr. Bobby Desai, and he's going to share his journey on a number of levels for us. Uh, he's going to make his own introduction because that's what the story and tale is about. But his particular concern and what is most important to engage with is language <coughs> with respect to his presentation. And his is the language of drawing. And just in the context of where you all are in your foundation studio and others who are coming from other faculties and courses, it's the importance of our shared language of drawing to explore, to communicate, to actually bring into being a response to the creative process. So what we're going to enjoy today is Mr. Bobby Desai's experience of his life journey, but expressing it through the medium of drawing. So if I could welcome him, first of all, and then invite... Thank you very much. If I could invite Ashani to give it a small token of our appreciation on your behalf. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I let him proceed without further ado. And in his own time, we'll see about how the possibility of generating an exchange follows on from this. So over to you, Bobby. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Um, do I need to stand here to be heard? Can you hear me? I can use that. Hello? Is that? Everybody can hear me? I think there's a. We need to press the button. Should Yeah, yeah it's great. Up close. Okay, um, I'm going to take you, as Arthur said, on a bit of a journey. Um, there are several hundred slides, so I hope you brought food and blankets and whatever. Uh, we might be here for a while. Um, I, the presentation is in two parts. Uh, one, the first section is the first section. Ah, there we go. The first section is um, about. Actually, I don't like that. I'll use this. The first section is about um, drawings. Now, what I've done, firstly, this talk is not an instructional talk. I'm not going to be showing you how to make a drawing. Um, it's also not a talk, talk about architecture. It's not about good architecture or bad architecture. It's simply a discussion and an opportunity to look at some beautiful drawings, which I will say something about in each case, and the meaning of drawings. That's the first section. The second section is about me. Um, how I started in architecture, where I studied, who I, who I was taught by, and, and where I worked, and where I've traveled. That section will be illustrated again with drawings and photographs, and I think in, uh, the attempt is to show um, that we arrive at this point in our lives through very complex and often contradictory routes, and as Arthur said, it is very much a journey. So I'll start with the first slide, which is I don't know how many people knew this, that actually I didn't know this until, I, uh, until yesterday, that actually the origins of the word design uh, is drawing, which is fascinating. So that's what we do. <coughs> Doesn't seem to be working. Great. So learning to draw, learning to draw, um, drawing to learn. So the two sections are the first section about drawing, the second section is about me. About drawing. So the role of drawing is foundational in learning and practicing architecture. So how does benefit how does drawing benefit us? Okay, so how does it benefit you and the way in which you work? I will get on to some drawings in a minute. So drawing builds new connections and pathways in our brain. Both sides uh, of the brain actively participate. The left side for logical thinking and the right for creativity. As a result, our brains grow. So drawing is actually good for you. How does it affect the way we work? So it develops coordination, helps visualization, enhances communication, builds analytical skills, and develops your eye, and also gives you great pleasure. Can we switch this light off as well? Is it possible? Yeah. 
Great, thank you. So things <coughs> that are drawn can be one of three things. They can be measured, they can be approximated, or they can be imagined. Of course, all three um, are not, don't operate individually, they overlap. And some of the most interesting design drawings happen at the intersection of these three uh, elements. Another interesting way of looking at them is, uh, is um, the fact that measured, approximated, and imagined all exist and are derived from either somewhere, anywhere, or nowhere. Now I'll come back to this diagram a little later when I start talking about drawings. Oops, backwards. So first, measured. Now here, when we talk about measured, we're, looking, we're talking about, some, there are some key words that are associated with um, measured. Uh, reality, detail, um, computed, determined, assessed, quantified, appraised, and documentation. <coughs> so measured is always somewhere. So drawings which are measured, any process of measuring is related to a specific location. Here are some examples of, very fine examples of measured drawings. I'll go through this quite quickly. So in all these drawings, they are uh, location specific and involve detailed analysis, measurement, and documentation. And of course, this operates at any scale. This is the, the scale of uh, a neighborhood. And of course, all, to all sorts of drawings um, are measured drawings. So approximation. Approximated means similar, is an estimation, has elements which are assumed, is something that's observed but not measured, and gives an overview. And these operate somewhere and can also operate anywhere. So these are some, actually these are my drawings. These were done in 1985. This was done a bit later. Street view. This is, students of mine came to India in the uh, early 2000s and they, one of the students did this drawing. Sorry. And this was also done by one of the students. This was later, in, on a later field trip from the RCA. In fact, this was done, Anand, if you remember, when we went to the kite flying in the old city, this drawing was done there. And this is Tagore Hall. And this is a, a wonderful portrait by Steve Smith, who has given a talk here. I think he's, he's on the board of studies here. And a drawing by Zaha Hadid. This is, I, I call this an approximation because it does have a site, a specific site, which is London, which you can just see here. This is the River Thames flowing through. And this is Buckminster Fuller's uh, speculation on Manhattan. Again, this is an approximation because it has an actual site. And this geodesic dome over the downtown. Now imagined. Fictional, fantastical, dreamed, envisaged, and speculative. Now, imagined operates in the realm of somewhere, anywhere, of course, but also nowhere. And you will see some drawings which are nowhere, literally. This is a wonderful little sketch, um, and, and incredibly emotive and simple, three or four lines, and obviously it's nowhere, but it could also be anywhere, and it talks of shelter from the sun, it talks of warmth, it talks of protection, it's a wonderful sketch, a very powerful sketch with very few lines, sorry. And again, this is a drawing that I did, we were um, asked to think about a botanical gardens. We weren't given a site, but we had five minutes and the client said, well, show us what it could be. So it's a very simple drawing. Again, can relate to any location. And from, from a very simple drawing to a very powerful, very complex constructed drawing by Boulay. Uh, again, the sense of scale, these tiny people here, and one can only imagine what it must be like to inhabit a space of this volume. Very powerful drawing. And Daniel Liebeskin, this is one of those nowhere or anywhere drawings. Um, his exploration of space and time. And this is, again, a very beautiful drawing, but perhaps a little faint. I think there's an enlarged version of this here. But you can look at the, see the intricacies 
of this drawing. It's absolutely extraordinary. And it reminds me of some of the uh, student work that I think Upra and Catherine's unit were doing that final jury. And sort of, uh, it's a beautiful drawing. And these are studies that my office did in London um, for a, again, these are, th th this is a, an imagined because again, we didn't have a site. Uh, we were giving a footprint and were asked to speculate on how a, a, a bar in the future <laughs> could be. Um, and the future was now. In fact, this was done about 15 years ago. So they said in 15 years time, what would, what would a bar be like? And this is one of my favorite architects, Mike Webb, who was a member of Archigram. And again, look at this amazing, um, using time in a drawing, you know, this whole sequence. Uh, it's called Kushikal. And you start with a suit, which you enter into, and then the suit evolves around you to create a space. Now, this is a fantastical um, speculation, but it also becomes a reality. And that is Mike Webb in the Kushikal at the AA. And of course, the most interesting design drawings, and I don't mean design solutions, I mean drawings, for the sake of drawing, often occur in the middle here. I put this in because I see this as a drawing where the ink is actually humans. This is Burning Man um, in California, which is an absolutely amazing image. And a drawing by Future Systems. I mean, this, I find an incredible drawing because it has enough sense of reality um, and yet it's complete speculation so in many ways it's a, it's a perfect design drawing so how you work how does drawing help how you work so it develops coordination helps visualization and, and enhances communication builds analytical skills and develops your eye so a few too many words here but basically through drawing uh, it, you know drawing works in the same way as any um, eye-hand coordination um, it refines your motor, fine motor skills. The more you practice drawing, the better you get, the better your hand, eyes, and brain can harmonize together. And your hands become an instrument to help you describe your thoughts and record the world around you. You know, keep sketch, but these are, again, wonderful sketches, you know, by a practiced um, artist, architect. So it helps visualization and enhances communication. Drawing helps us map out mental images of our ideas and concepts. Actually, I can look at this. We can map out, map out plans, diagrams, and concepts, and what we want to bring into the world. How a system works can be more effectively shown in an image. Visual aids often help us comprehend large amounts of data that our brain cannot understand through numbers or words alone. Drawing allows the architect to portray mood, emotion, and atmosphere. So the difference, and, and this, is a, this is a very important point actually, there's a huge difference between drawing something up and drawing something out. When you draw something out, it's a design process. Uh, this is a, again one of my drawings, and which was for a, a, um, an art gallery. An art gallery which is situated between two historic buildings. So the technique in this drawing, the technique of um, using a particular palette of colors, um, bringing out the extension by putting, applying sciography just to the, to my uh, intervention. And, you know, just prof you know, there's a, the, there's a lot of work when you do a drawing like this, you know, you're doing a lot of profiling in terms of the, the, the profile of the building and how it relates to the existing buildings. You put in context just to show that it's not, you know, that situates the existing buildings as well. And again, some of my drawings, um, drawing, often you draw something that seems quite ludicrous and fantastical. And sometimes you get the chance to build it, so never be shy to draw <laughs> crazy things. Sometimes they get built. This is by a project by Karl Penumbla in Germany, in Austria, sorry. Again, it's a fascinating process. Here's a sketch that you would think was unbuildable. They tested um, the idea of that. It's a rooftop extension. They tested the idea of a rooftop extension using a, a collage technique. So they photographed the building, created a perspective view of it, and then speculated their proposal on top. 
that becomes a working, uh, not a working drawing, that becomes a general arrangement drawing and plan. And they built it. So it's amazing. So from that to that to this. And it, that, this, this is the journey that we do as architects. We undertake as architects. So I'll get the hang of this in a minute. Again, you know, this is Lebius Woods. And uh, one of the key things that um, drawings enable architects to do is to portray mood, atmosphere, and emotion. It's a wonderful drawing. But what makes this drawing a reality is these two figures here. They give it scale. One can imagine oneself in this space just because of this simple device of putting people in the drawing. And you'll see a lot of my drawings later, I, put, I always put people in to give scale. Okay, and this guy makes this architecture. Without him, it could be anything. These are drawings by Louis Kahn, and they're plans through English castles. The white is the inhabitable space, and this is the thickness of the wall of the castles. Again, a beautiful set of drawings, which um, he did as a student. And you can see where the preoccupations of his later work, that the, 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 these are underlying preoccupations in his later work. And drawings by Neil Denari. I put these in, again, as I said at the beginning, this, isn't, this talk is not about what is good architecture or what is bad architecture. It's really just about the power of drawing and how skilled artists, architects, can use drawings to convey meaning, materiality, scale. I, thought, I find these absolutely fascinating. Here's some more. And this has been described this is, again, one of my favorite images. It's been described as one of the most, the, the very first infographic uh, by Charles Minard. And it describes Napoleon's disastrous assault on Moscow. He starts off here with 40,000 troops. Under this diagram, there's a map. So these are rivers. He starts off with 40,000 troops. As he travels towards Moscow, his troops numbers diminish. People are dying, soldiers are dying. So why are they dying? You look at this graph down here and it shows the terrain that they're climbing at each point and the temperature. And the, when he gets to Moscow, he's down to, I think, 100,000. So from 400,000 to 100,000 at Moscow. This is the retreat. Again, people are, soldiers are dropping like flies all the way along here. At this point, some soldiers decided that they'd had enough and went back, back home. He returns with only 4,000 out of 400,000. So in one diagram, there's a wealth of the six-dimensional information in one diagram. Absolutely powerful. Of course, modeling is very important. You know, these are some models that, that, that I'd made as a, uh, in my office for a study for um, a TV uh, recording studios. Again, beautiful drawings. These are archigram drawings, showing process, evolution of form. And you start off, you can almost imagine this, you know, you, f you float this down the river and then it sort of evolves and creates a habitat. Again, a beautiful drawing. Uh, Peter Cook drawing, again, archigram. Cities of the next century. And perspective, simple. These are uh, Richard Neutra drawings, very simple simply constructed perspective drawings and of course scale you can uh, you know without getting specific you can give a sense of scale vastness of the scheme and again this is a nowhere this is Lebius Woods um, uh, speculation on a tomb for Einstein and um, Bernard Schumi's um, villas at La Parc La Villette Again, this is about rhythm, strategy. You can see the evolution of each one of these forms. And a student of mine at the RCA, in a beautiful drawing, absolutely beautiful drawing. And back to Boulay. Again, these are just so powerful, these images, nature and man. And Leon Crea's speculations on the classical, on, uh, interventions on a classical city. Again, this part elevation, part plan, you yeah, know, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And Neil Dinari again, Park La Villette, Bernard Schumi. 
Again, this is a drawing by one of my students. Um, the last batch, a very powerful drawing. And a drawing as a model. And so again, these are all techniques I hope you can, you can think about on your work. Perhaps, again, you know, and we talked about creating mood. This is an absolutely epic uh, render. And color to differentiate your scheme. And Super Studio, a particular favorite of mine, architects. You know, they, in a very simple device, but, you, but this promises, so it, it's a drawing with so much potential. What's it like to be inside this thing? How deep is this? How are you going? Do you travel along here? Does the river continue to flow through this? And that's it. Very powerful drawings, uh, sections in different techniques. Um, adding uh, animation to a drawing, you know, not literal animation. And Leon Creer's cemetery. I mean, it, it, when you study this drawing, if I hadn't said it was a cemetery, I know you had to guess what it was. I think many of you would come up with cemetery, and it's because it's the power of the drawing, the techniques used, the shadows, the melancholy drawing style. And future systems, a prop proposition for a tower in Manhattan. A beautifully drawn structure. Again, this is another future systems project. And again, future systems again, you look at this and you think, how could, how, you know, how could this ever be a real building? But of course it is. This is Lord's in London. Uh, in fact, Catherine's practice worked on a pavilion on the other side of this in uh, Marlebone. Sorry, again backwards. And drawings, these, these are my drawings, and drawings can um, show phasing, can tell a story. So this was a proposition for Zydus, and they wanted a phase development. So in, 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 a one set, in a two or three drawings, in one set of drawings, you can show how the, the campus can evolve and be phased. And finally, there were towers proposed. One thing that should have happened is this airplane should have moved across. That would have been good. Maybe it's a balloon. And these are my drawings again of the inside of those spaces. <coughs> in putting people in drawings. Uh, and these drawings are very fast. I mean, the, 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 the key to drawing as a practitioner is to be efficient and be fast with these. You know, artists can labor over their drawings. And, but I think as architects, we have to be quite, quite skilled and quite fast at what we do. So builds analytical skills. When drawing whether consciously or not, we are making decisions about what we are depicting. This improves de decision-making skills and helps with problem solving. Drawings enable us to design in a systematic manner with a sequence in effect. If a drawing isn't going the way it was intended, an architect has to be able to step back and make a rational decisions about how to fix it. Again, this is about productivity. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we're not precious about drawings. We have to be able to tear them up and start again. It's very, very important. This is an interesting sequence of slides, and it's about the... It, 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 it's an OMA project, um, and it just describes the steps we take as architects. So, you, you know, one day this pile of papers arrives on your desk, and it's the client brief. You go through it, you distill... This is for a library. So you figure out using color and a drawing, what's required? What does the client want? All right, so this is the original program. These are all the elements of the project. And the first step is the architect has color coded these things so you can visualize what components go where and what scale they are. These are all relative to the overall square footage of the building. Then you say the most important thing in this building are the books. So pull all the blue out of here, all the different types of books, and put that there. So 32% of the building is for books. I mean, it sounds like a revelation to understand that, but it's quite difficult to get to that point. And then you consolidate the program, and then you reshuffle the program in a way that works more efficiently for the client. Now, what was the design brief? The design brief is to, find the book, to reduce the amount of time it takes to find books. So from 16 minutes to 7 minutes. You reorganize the brief and consider the adjacencies. So these are the negative. This is a negative drawing of this. So here's this is the ramp and this is the ramp. This is the spiral where the books will be, reading room. 
et cetera. You make a diagram like this. So you go from this diagram to this diagram, which is almost a building. You make a model of it, and then there's the building. Now that process is, as architects, as problem-solving professionals, that is the process. Almost every project, no matter what scale, one goes through as an architect. This is one of our projects in the office. We went through a similar sort of program. Here are the brief. Here was the brief. Sorry, we color coded it so we could understand uh, visually what the main components were. We then gave each of the components a little diagram. Unpacked, packed it up, unpacked it, combined these four elements into different <coughs> configurations, and arranged them in the building. And of course, you can use drawings. That's the same. This is the same building. You can use drawings to, sorry, you can use drawings to describe how the sun moves around the building, how the wind would pass through the building, how you might collect rainwater, rainwater harvesting, how each of the facades of the building could be treated, or should be treated differently to re respond to the climate and orientation. And then back to sketching, you know, what's the tower, how, I mean, these are done in five, you know, you know 15 seconds, 15 second options, just to, just to keep thinking about how this could be uh, resolved. Now, that just doesn't mean there isn't deep thinking behind the processes. But often, you know, th there's a lot of rubbing of chin and not enough sketching. You know, so it's important to sketch. Here's the elevation of the building. Again, how is it stacked? Sorry. How is it stacked? You have signage. You have the lantern, we call at the top, which is the chairman's office. You have general offices. You have a social zone, more offices, the entrance, the street. And again, back to sketching, fast. You know, is, is this the language of the building? Is you know, with a helipad? Is this the language of the building? Again, these are my sketches. These are my sketches as well. Exploring the facade elements. This is all done fast with crayons, pen, colored pencils, uh, CAD drawings, and eventually it becomes a small model. And unfortunately, it didn't become a building. Again, complex forms. You know, I think as architects and um, designers. If we don't play with airfix, we're not learning. Um, again, some of the finest drawings are done for these models. And you know, this highly complicated thing it gets you into making, gets you into drawing. I think my fascination with drawing started with these airfix kits. And of course, it develops your eyes. Some people believe that architects see differently. Now, it may, not, may or may not be true, but I think people who draw and sketch a lot are better at picking up on um, are better at picking up on proportions, relationships, and compositions. They're often good judges of spatial relationships as well as measurements and distances. So drawing and sketching is inc incredibly important. Uh, beautiful drawings. Yeah. This is one of my favorites. I mean, sim how, 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 how few marks you can put on a piece of paper to convey. And this is Richard Rogers. And you know, just the way this is drawn uh, has the promise of this thing being able to collapse and, and fold, and of course it can't, but you know. And probably the first ever drawing of an electric car. You know. <coughs> and of course drawing gives pleasure. So drawing in me, here's the world. This is an interesting way of looking at the world. This is a Dynamaxian um, map, a globe. If you unfold it, this is what you get. This is important because I think that you know, we, we're so used to seeing things in a particular way. And when someone brilliant like Buckminster Fuller comes along and says, well, actually, you, know, you can look at the world in many different ways. So I've used this to map, to make a, uh, essentially a portrait of myself. So here, I was born in Kenya, traveled to London. <coughs> Up until about 14 years of age, I did this once a year. Then I moved to London. From London, I started studying architecture, but I traveled to New York and Los Angeles. New York to look at Cooper Union School of Architecture, and Los Angeles to look at uh, SIOC. In London, I studied at Kingston University, and, I've, uh, and the Architectural Association, and I've put my tutors here 
And I'm going to show you some of the work that they did, because I think it's really important, as Arthur was saying, that these are all important components of a journey. And uh, these people actually shape the way that you develop as a designer. So the, this is Jeffrey Powers. He was my tutor in third year at Kingston. And he was a director, a partner, or uh, a partner, I think, uh, in Future Systems. And Jeffrey introduced me to this sort of drawing and this sort of architecture. I'd never seen anything like this before. Yeah, absolutely wonderful drawings. These are all done by Jan Kaplicki, actually, but um, Jeffrey was working in the office at the time. That's me at the Architectural Association with hair. No hat, but hair. And this is the Architectural Association, which in itself is an extraordinary project. You know, these are individual houses, or were individual houses, but they form the most, still I think one of the best schools of architecture in the world. And I was taught in, my, in the first unit by a guy called John Fraser, who authored this book called uh, uh, An uh, Evolutionary Architecture. <coughs> His interests were <coughs> Um, cybernetics, um, uh, systems. He was a software writer and an architect, and that, in that unit we were preoccupied with these sorts of things, the interface between humans and uh, machines and robotics. And my technical tutor was a guy called Mark Fisher, who was in, very much interested in pneumatic structures. And Mark Fisher, these are his drawings. Mark Fisher was the set designer for many concepts, and this is the Who. Uh, Pink Floyd, sorry, this is for Pink Floyd. And these are the, this is the sort, of, uh, sort of installations that he was uh, interested in, and he taught us about in that unit. And this is an excerpt from one of the AA files on my work. Uh, so John Fraser, and um, I won't read this, but this was about uh, a speculation on a building that could replicate itself using um, crystallography, the rules that crystals grow, the rules that crystals follow to grow. And this, this is an uh, extra. And again, some drawings that I did back then, and a model. Again, a model for that unit that I had made. And then, in my second year at the AA, I was taught by Ron Heron. Here's Ron Heron in front of the Pompidou Center. And the most, one of the most iconic drawings, architectural drawings, uh, by Ron Heron, The Walking City. And one of my favorite projects was um, Suburban Sets. And the proposition here was that behind the set, behind the facade of um, a typical London street, you could actually speculate on a very different uh, way of living. And my technical tutor, I mean, I'm absolutely privileged to have been taught by these people. Uh, was Cedric Price, who always had a cigar in his mouth and a bottle of brandy nearby. And this is a great quote by him: "Technology is the answer, but what was the question?" And he was the he, he built very little, uh, but this is one of the most celebrated ones: is an aviary in Regent's Park in London Zoo. These are his sketches, very simple little diagrams, and this is built. What's interesting about this is that it's actually, um, uh, it's a tensegrity structure, which basically means that, that um, very, it, it, it uses compression members without resolving the load to the ground. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. So you see these things here are actually floating. They're suspended. And it touches the ground. They're connect hung from these two legs here. So this whole thing is just sort of floating. It's an extraordinary um, structure. And it's an aviary, so you know, this notion of it flying and floating is there. And of course, Peter Cook, who, like myself, obsessed with, passionate, let's say, about drawing. This is one of his drawings. It's quite quickly. And together, this is Archigram. Um, probably had the greatest influence on me. This is uh, David Green, Peter Cook, Mike Webb, who does the absolute artist, Ron Heron, and Dennis Crompton. At the AA, probably in the 70s, I think. 
So drawing precedes writing as a method of intellectual exploration. This is my final year, final project, in the final year, which was a monastery. Now this monastery was inspired by La Tourette. And what I loved about this project, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful building, but what I was fascinated was by this thing here, which are the windows onto the refractory behind. Now these vertical members are designed to reflect the landscape beyond. So when you're, si when you're sitting in the refectory as a monk, in silence, you look out through the refectory window and the whole landscape is marked, modulated by these vertical <laughs> things. So as the hills go up, the verticals get closer together. As the hill uh, in a valley, the things are further apart. And I'm not quite sure what the horizontal transoms are for, uh, what they represent, but they're also part of the story of the landscape beyond. So my project, uh, here is the model. It's, it was situated in, on the River Avon, uh, near Bristol in England. And it was situated there because I wanted to use water and I wanted to use light. The River Avon, at this point, at Portis Head, has the second highest tidal movement in the world. It's a 14 meter tidal difference. It's an incredibly powerful rush of water comes in. So this is the, uh, the monastery, this is the elevation of the monastery, so if you cut a line this way, look at it up that way. The refractory is here, and all of these strange protruding elements bring reflected light into the refractory space. And the monks' cells, and there's probably another drawing somewhere. These are very poor slides because I didn't, couldn't find the original drawings. Um, but yeah, here you can just see the monks' cells here. This is the big window that lets the light in. And all these tubes suck light in. Oh, here's a better drawing. So these are the monk cells. This is the refractory space. Now the refractory space is defined by two shells. This one, the outer shell and the inner shell. The inner shell moves in the vertical axis and the outer shell moves in the lateral axis. You can see here. So this is the inner shell, this is the outer shell, these are the monk's cells. The refractory is the big window here, underneath here. And you can see that the outer shell moves in this direction, with the tide. So if I cut a section through here, here we go. So there's the inner shell, the outer shell, these are flotation devices. So this moves into that position when the tide's out, this point being here. And this one moves in the other plane. And this is the refractory space here. And if you look at that, that's the elevation. So these are all the tide. And, the, uh, and all these drawings were done with a specific, I think about 15 of these drawings were done. Um, and each one had a very specific date, a time of the day, and the tide level. So here, this, this, this is a good drawing, because it shows that movement. So when the, on this date, the 13th of July, 1990, at five o'clock in the morning, the tide is only at one meter and 40 centimeters, so it's very low. This is this green here. So it's almost, there's almost no water at all. So the inner shell has sunk to this position. The outer shell is, is on a pivot and it's swung in. Now the light comes in from here, bounces from here and goes into here. This light patch defines that effect. This shows it in a more technical manner. The pool of light is defined by lines Y, it's Y like that. And here it is in the plan, it takes this form. And this um, diagram helps me work out the direction of the sun. That's the elevation again, sorry, it's repeated. Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. All right, so, th so this is at five o'clock in the morning at one meter and 40 tide level. The next drawing is at 3.10 in the afternoon and the tide is at six meters. You see there's more water, this is floating, this is moved out. The pool of light inside the refectory is very different. The light comes in here, bounces off the water. X, X defines that pool, and you can see it here in this drawing. <coughs> so 
this is repeated, sorry. Right, how to explain this? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try. This is a section, um, I, I couldn't find all the drawings, but this is a section through the monastery. These points define the cells, the front of the cell and the back of the cell. This is the window, the lens, and the lens details are here. The specification is a focal length of 21. And this is, through that lens, a projection of the same cells on this side of the drawing. So this is the plane of the lens. And I did this drawing. This is a section, and this is a plan. And my ambition, rather <laughs> foolish ambition, was to try and reconstruct the distorted image of the cells. But I couldn't do it. So I've got these drawings, and that's as far as I could go with it. As a mouse. So here's a, here's a drawing that shows the effect in the refractory. Here's the refractory, here are the cells, um, the monk cells. This is the inner cowl, and this is the effect of the water on the thing. And it's something that... Um, I'll read this actually. This, so, this is, so during his fourth year in John Fraser's Diploma Unit 14, Bobby Desai developed an essentially scientific approach to designing of buildings, which applied to his fifth year work. The monastery project, situated on the River Avon, became a vehicle for studying the possibilities of lighting a building indirectly, using the water as a reflector, as well as a source of energy for moving large-scale parts of the building. Desai spent a lot of time studying the effect of this indirect lighting on the quality of the internal environment, the work is thorough, almost obsessive, in its use of sketches, drawings, and models to describe the architecture. But at the same time, it has a level of invention and wit that we encouraged and enjoyed a memorable and idiosyncratic project. And this is another project I did in the same unit. This was called the Soho Rooftop Crawler. Again, it's a purely speculative project. This is Berwick Street, some photographs of Berwick Street in Soho. And my proposition was this sort of um, biomorphic apparatus. Ah, oh, thanks. Um, uh, biomorphic apparatus that could s that could that would crawl along the rooftops of Soho, sampling the air and the sounds and the lights and projecting them, ultimately on this screen. Yeah. That's it in a different position along um, Berwick Street. And again, some drawings. Again, poor slides, but. Um, so here it is. The red shows where it's been or where it's going, and this is where it is at the moment. And you can see its legs dangling as it walks along. This is my own version of Walking City, I guess. And this is the time and what it's sampling. You know. It's not very clear. And a section through uh, a rooftop and how it sits and hugs the top of the roofs and how it moves along. And it's same in plan. So this is moving from position A to position B. And then I worked at Heron Associates. Um, I worked for, after I graduated, Ron offered me a job. In fact, even while, whilst I was studying, I was working for him. Um, and this is a project we did together. This is a sketch that I did of, um, actually no, this is Ron's sketch. This is, this is Ron's sketch. So of the building that we worked in. And the significance of this, will, I'll show you now. So it, originally there were two buildings. And um, the owner wanted to connect them in some way. Actually, the owner wanted to sell the buildings and move to another property where he would have one building. But Ron said, no, we can work something out here. And we connected the two buildings with these steel staircases, uh, uh, bridges. And the bridges go from existing opening to existing opening. So the bridges are all at funny angles. So from one window here, you connect to another window there, between two very different buildings. And this is the roof plan. And this is the section through. So here's, here are the two buildings. You can see the bridges are at different angles. So by roofing over that original, very simple sketch, by roofing over the two buildings, you create an atrium space and you create the facility to move between the two buildings in shade. This is a long section, so here's that roofing element going all the way through. These are all my drawings, by the way. And th these are all my drawings and they're all drawn by hand. These are, there were no CAD. There's no CAD then. 
again, it's a drawing that I did, axonometric of the roof structure. And this has got quite pixelated, but again, my drawing of the details. And this is what the internal space is like. These are the bridges going at funny angles. The atrium space. And this is a building, and, and here it is. And this is where we worked. This is where the office was. And there's a book that you might have in the library on it. And from an adjoining building looking down on it. So then I came to Ahmedabad. Um, Ahmedabad and Mumbai. And I worked with Doshi. This looks like I'm but I'm, I'm not, I'm not, th th that's my hands there. <coughs> I mean, I'm very fond of him, and I am very fond of him, but I, that's not my hand. Uh, I worked a little bit on the, the Gufa, not too much, the, but the main project I worked on, and this is you know, wonderful Doshi working with his hands on the model. These are photographs by Anand Patel, and a sketch by Doshi. And I worked on the Bharat Diamond Boss. Uh, which uh, you may not be familiar with, it was a big um, master plan project in Mumbai. This is one of the early study models. And as a young architect, I was given the, the job of looking at how, um, bringing some of my learning from London and some of the techniques and architectural syntax um, that I developed to this project. Uh, actually, there should be a model. Oh, it's gone. There was a model of the building. Uh, so these are my drawings, uh, the section through one of the towers, and I was very taken, and, I, I, and what I should have mentioned actually, it was the first time I'd ever been to India. So I came to India at the age of 27, I'd never been here before. So I was obviously somewhat shocked by the heat and the sun, and so it became a real preoccupation of mine, that how do you protect buildings from the sun, and how do you keep the monsoon rain off? So I was proposing these wings that would, fl that would attach themselves to the length of the towers. Here's a detail of the same thing. So there's a, there's a, there's a, neat, a neat connection between this sort of drawing style and this architectural language and the stuff I was doing in London. And then at the same time, uh, you know, then I moved from Ahmedabad to Mumbai to run Doshi's design studio in, in, in Mumbai. And Catherine and I, we met in Doshi's office actually in 92. Um, but we set up a small practice called Moo. And one of the first projects that we did was, again, my preoccupation with lightweight structures and steel detailing ten and tensile structures. The first, one of the first projects we did was a, a rooftop extension to an existing school. This is one of my first in, uh, initial concept sketch for it. This was the office, me, a, a very dear friend of mine um, and Catherine's, um, Rajiv Lunkard and Catherine on site. Very early vector works. CAD was now the drawing that I showed you of the B of the tower at uh, Diamond Boss was drawn by hand. This is when CAD really started. So these are vector works drawings that I'd done, and it's uh, these are the only photographs I have of it. I don't have any during the day, which is a shame. But um, yeah, here it is built. There's some of the internal spaces. And we also did a prop proposal for a penthouse, and this only exists in model form. But again, the mo modeling is important. You know, we use cardboard, very simple models. Um, from Ahmedabad, after a short trip to London, I went to stay in Melbourne, where Catherine was doing her masters. And I worked for a company called Woods Baggett. Um, my main job was working on a, a terminal building for Qantas, but I couldn't find any images, any drawings of that. But I did work briefly on this house, which is an absolutely beautiful beach house. Um, I mean, what a drawing. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, and made out of core 10 steel. And then I flew back to London. From London, um, I traveled a lot for work and for teaching. So the blue dots are international sites for projects and the purple dots are teaching venues. So in London I worked for Terry Farrell 
Um, this is a book that I helped put together, which contains a lot of my sketches. So here are some very quick sketches for the uh, uh, National Aquarium in London. Again, really fast, showing how the air would move through. The idea was to create a microclimate inside here. So how you collect the water, keep the sun off, very simple, very fast. Uh, a collage that I had done showing how the, uh, the, what the tectonic could be. So you have a glass box and you have this sort of naturalistic form uh, for the habitats for the fish. And then some solar device, cross-section. Eventually turned into a slightly unsatisfactory architectural object, this thing. But um, it didn't get built, so that's okay. Um, now I'm going to go quite quickly through some, just some sketches that, uh, and drawings that I'd done whilst I was there. This is for a church, and a model of it. Um, sketches for a building in South Korea, uh, model. Um, again, this is studies uh, for a tower. Um, in various different design studies, but eventually we settled on this conical form. And then this was my favorite version of it, and my favorite drawing of mine of it. So I find this occupation with that helicopter. Again, many iterations of the same building. But what's interesting is that the, the, the just generating more and more versions of it. Industrial facility, but again, I think it's a drawing I, I like a lot. Um, again, I had a lot of fun making these. Cement works. And that was the office, and that's me. Again, with hair. And then I set, left Terry Farrell's and set up my own practice, uh, which was originally called Clark Desai. Uh, I started the practice with a guy called George Clark, uh, who you may have seen on television. Um, and we, we had quite an interesting model, very ambitious model for our practice. We were small. Um, but we had, we did architecture, of course. We also had a building company. We were involved in TV and media through um, writing, um, 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 writing for programs. And George pr started off presenting programs, um, and now he makes programs. We did research. Um, we had a development company. We organized events. We dabbled in publishing, we did urban design, and we also offered design consultancy to the larger practices. So in architecture, again, I'll try and, um, you know, we were always put drawings at the heart of everything that we did. So these are some Photoshop drawings that I did of a swimming pool that we did. Um, and it, this is the slightly out of focus um, photographs of it constructed. This is an interesting project. This was a competition that was run by a developer and this was his site and they had all these trees and in England as here trees are protected and each one of these trees had a what's called a tree preservation order which means you cannot cut it down so the competition was to build a house on this site one house so many of the the only places you can build are sort of here or here or maybe here, I don't know. But you can't really get a very big house on that site, and it was a very expensive site. So you wanted to make, build a big house so you could sell it, make lots of money. We won the competition because we said, actually, what we can do is give you three big houses on the site. And the way we do that is we negotiate the gaps between the trees, and we build three houses, one here, one here, and one here. And where there's space, we'll put the living room. So the house is a standard component. The bedrooms, living, uh, dining, bathrooms, TV rooms, all of that is in this beam here. And the living rooms are sitting in the gardens here. So essentially creating courtyard houses. So here's a little study model. It's quite awkward. Oh. Okay, that's bit better. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so here are my design studies for that house, looking at how the section is, how the living space could be a double height space, and that the blank wall, because of course when you do a house, when you do houses like this, this guy looks this way, but he looks onto a blank wall. 
the sky looks this way, but it looks on a blank wall. So he is a, each one of these houses is afforded a great deal of privacy. And here's a sketch, a sketch section through the double height living space. This is the beam of accommodation behind, the bedrooms on the top, the dining, there's actually people sitting there eating, the dining room here, the kitchens, and the, you know, this obviously, this gives you the opportunity to have a big volume looking both ways into the garden. Another section, uh, house one, two, and three, the garden, the blank wall, creepers growing up, Here's the living space, the bedrooms, and the main circulation sort of axis is at the back, which is top lit. I mean, I think rather than the architecture, I think the drawings are what you should be, what, what I think are important. And back in those days, this was the height of tech, uh, computer modeling. This is, uh, I forget the software, but you know, pretty crude by today's standards. And under construction, finished. It's one of the courtyards here. Yeah. This is the dining space. This is the double height living space. The main axis, which is top lit. And here they are in sight. This is the River Thames. So this is Henley, which is a very, very expensive part of London. Here was the site. And here are the three houses. Here are the three living spaces. The trees seem to have disappeared. Yeah, but Oh well. Uh, a sketch of a social housing scheme that we are working on in East London. Um, I'll go through this quite quickly. Again, using drawings and color coding to uh, organize the buildings, using diagrams to show how the materials might change. Um, and then I designed an art gallery in East London, um, which uh, Andrew Mead had very nice things to say about. I'll show you it. It's here, it's black. And it's got one window. Um, and you can see it here. And again, very simple sketch-up models showing the spaces. Some photographs of the inside. And this was the opening, opening night. Yeah. And then we're a construction company as well. So we knew how to build things as well as draw them. Uh, these are some, are some of these are our designs and some are other people's designs. Uh, you won't <coughs> linger on these. And then urban design. Um, this is Australia, Parramatta, and we were asked to think about two stations along the new Parramatta line. So we worked with Steve Smith on this. I think this is his drawing, actually, his analysis. But this is my model of one of the stations, which is Camellia Station. And the idea was that you have a, at the edge of the site, you have commercial developments and apartments, and then the station is at the heart of the site, which has this iconic. Um, element that announces that the station is there. Again, another model that I'd made using Perspex for the second station on the Parramatta line, which is underground here. And this was the commercial development around the site. And then the South Bank. Steve and I worked with the South Bank Center. This is, it's funny how these things come full circle. This was designed by Ron Heron when he was working for the local authority. Um, and it's uh, Queen Elizabeth Hall and South Bank Centre in London. Uh, quite a brutalist, well it is a brutalist architecture. Now what Steve and I were interested in was, we, we were asked by the South Bank Centre how they could use their buildings um, more imaginatively, more creatively, how they could attract more people to the site. Now how do you deal with a building, you know, how, how do you bring life to such a, uh, a robust, brutalist building? So we had this idea about the ephemeral city. So how do, you, how do we bring events, um, you know, how do you just bring temporary structures, how can you enliven it without um, going through all the, the processes of getting consents and all that sort of thing. So we thought, you know, we thought we could reimagine it as the ephemeral city. And talking about full circle, then this was Ron Heron's um, drawing of how he would improve it. This was done sort of 20 years later, you know, by putting tents and graphics and signage and you know, very hippie. You know. uh, so it's a model that the office made, my office made, uh, to investigate it. 
And so how do you take it from this to this um, drawing that I had made to, uh, to, as, a, as a speculation on how it could be brought to life? And we did. We did. We introduced um, several elements. We introduced this staircase. This is a stage, so people can stand here and perform. We introduced this ticket kiosk, so you don't have to go into the building to buy tickets. We proposed these uh, shipping container restaurants on the deck. We made a garden up here, which was an unused roof. Um, this, this boat is by somebody else. And we transform a space that looks like this into a a space that looks like this, just by enclosing, you know, here with with plastic, with plastic sheets, you know, which you can just see here, and that's me enjoying the cup of tea. I think it is there. Is that tea? Um, and then a, a, another drawing of mine of York. Um, again, I think we now. And then consultancy. So we're a small practice, but we do consultancy. We did consultancy for big <coughs> companies, which means which meant we could work on big projects. Oh. So this is um, Seoul in Korea, and it's a tra it's a tra it's an airport, uh, airport terminal building. This is a physical model of it. So we developed lots of different prototypes for it. Ah, oh, this is really grabbing my shoulder. Uh, some of my sketches of how the how the neck could evolve. There's some nice drawings. And again, my drawings of the structure. Sectional drawing. Uh, and the neck and it got built so this is the interior exterior out of focus the interior spaces so you know and, and as a small practice there's no way we would ever give be commissioned to work on uh, to be the architects for such a huge project but you know I've had very generous employers so Terry brought us in Terry Farrell brought us in and said you know would you give us a hand with it? So we did, it was great fun. This is Kowloon Master Plan, and a very similar situation. The office, Terry's office was given the opportunity to design this tower here. And these are designs that basically we did, I did and for that tower. And then research, we were very interested in, again, this is 20 years ago, we were very interested in, back then in prefabricated off-site construction. So this is a diagram that shows a family going into and we'd actually formed this company called Fab Homes. You know, you go into here, you place an order. That's what computers looked like in those days. It does drawings for you, goes to the factory, gets production, comes out, gets on a crane, and there you have. Welcome to your Fab Home. But that led to this project, which I worked on with um, my teaching partner, Clive Saul, which is a school. Um, school sports hall constructed out of shipping containers. So these are just, this is, these are shipping containers just stacked together. This is what it's like in the shipping container. So you can walk around and we cut these slots in so that you could look into the sports hall from the gallery space. Okay, and then teaching. I did a lot of teaching, um, mostly at the Royal College of Art for nearly 10 years with Clive Saul. And writing, so drawing, writing, modeling, teaching. Um, <coughs> I wrote essays which were published in these journals. This is one of my students' work, um, Lucy Wood. So a wonderful drawing and a model of the same scheme, just using paper. You know. And then I came to Ahmedabad, back to Ahmedabad. Um, this was a scheme, again, we were not given a site. Uh, we were told, 
on a 100 acre site design a university campus. And these were the main faculties, the medical school, engineering school, uh, liberal arts school, and media and communication school. So the idea was to centre those faculties around, again, the drawings are more important, the drawings are more important than the design, I think, you know. So how using drawing very quickly to organise uh, buildings on the site, thinking about an axis, thinking about movement, that becomes a, uh, a more formal diagram. So well, the faculties are centred around the sports area, your entrance here, and you've got the faculty and student housing at the side, the back of the site. That becomes this sort of ideogram of uh, green and buffer spaces, the faculties here, the green space in the middle, the buffer and the housing. The other thing the client wanted was a monorail. It was a big deal for him. I've got to have a monorail in my campus. So this is the monorail route, takes you around, these are the stations. And from here, you get a drawing like this, which is, um, again, a very simple sketch of mine that just shows how the buildings, all the various faculties can be organized around the central space, the sports facilities in the middle, the student and faculty housing at the back here, um, with some green spaces and uh, leisure facilities, and space here to expand the campus, should they ever build it. Okay, so, this is it. so now it's color coded, so you can see where all the faculties are, um, and where the housing is. And. Uh, all, all, all sketches of mine, um, I've been here now five years, so I would love to come back and talk about this work at some point, but uh, yeah, just the power of the diagrams, you know, we were trying to convince a client not to build isolated towers in the landscape. But actually, this, this scheme houses 2,000 students, but the, in, this, in the same area, with this option, you can house 2,000 students. But this gives you wonderful shaded streets, courtyards, it's low rise, uh, it's, you don't feel isolated, and much more humane, much more humanistic. And then sketching. Uh, we're, we are working on an exhibition center on the, on the I'm not going to say River Thames, on the River Sabamati. So this was the very first little sketch that I did of how the, the main hall could be used and how there could be a, a street here and how it relates to the, riv to the river. That sketch becomes a drawing like this. It's still a sketch, slightly more evolved. Here's the veranda, huge double height, triple height veranda. <coughs> Here's the main hall, exhibition hall. Some Porsches hanging off the thing. And walkway with trees, tree line, services at the back, loading bay from the back here. And a sketch of what the front elevation might look like. So this is hall C. Again, again using drawings fast, using writing, you know, stacking up the drawings so that you know where everything is organized. And it becomes a CAD drawing. It's not a very nice CAD drawing. This is a sports center that we're working on. Again, using the, uh, creating a large open span space here. A quick sketch which alludes to the fact that, you know, that there's gonna be quite heavy structure here. So you can use all this space for ancillary services and things. That's the upper level and sketches of the elevation, front elevation, and section through the lobby. Again, sketches showing that actually you've got this depth of structure. You can use it. You can use it for bathrooms, you can put air handling units here, and you can create a gallery so people can look down into the sports center. Becomes a drawing like this. <coughs> Becomes this long section. This is the roof and a rendering of the front elevation and a physical model. Okay, page from the sketchbook. Uh, I'm gonna skip this project. Except that one drawing. So drawing is an integrator of ideas and writing segregates ideas. And a drawing I did in six hours of Ahmedabad Central Business District here and the River Salamati. Thank you. So, uh, any questions? Oh, sorry. There is a, a feast. If we had been at the most incredible marriage feast with uh, 
with every kind of dish before you. You couldn't imagine a greater... Uh, there were, there were a couple of Luddus in there, that's, uh, for, sure. <laughs> that's for sure. So, uh, thanks to, to Bobby, but um, this is um, incredibly important what he has presented us with, because uh, this is absolutely real at every moment. There's nothing fantastic here. It's an engagement through this language with a process of inquiry. Of course there's fantasy and as much as you explore, you, you experiment, you wonder, but the grounding is arriving at a solution. So this is, he had, at the very beginning he mentioned a distinction between art and the process of drawing that he was engaged with. And I think there's a very clear distinction to be made in terms of arriving at solutions, arriving at um, processes of engagement and inquiry that produce results. So um, he, he's given us a really wonderful um, narrative uh, which also demonstrates his journey, uh, the journey that is still very much ongoing, that now indeed covers the globe, and I expect uh, there are other parts of the world that he has yet to land up in. Um, I'm not sure what the plan is, but um, just to, to thank him for that. But now projecting it back to you, projecting it back to where you are in terms of your acquisition of skills, so landing up here, uh, having a pencil in your hand, um, engaging with the discipline of uh, assignments, of um, understanding the world around you, understanding scale, uh, materiality, forms, the complexity of combining elements to each other. So that all is where Bobby came from. So where you are now I is the beginning of a journey that Bobby is on. So I think there's a very, very important connection that you can make in looking at this for yourselves. And if there's anything that you'd like to t uh, talk to him about, uh, anything that you're in the midst of at the moment that you're wondering about, I'm sure he'd be very happy to, to respond personally. And then if anything that you have uh, that becomes a, <coughs> an inquiry for understanding more about his own journey, uh, he'd also be delighted to share with you as well. So um, just in the usual way, we try to tease you out to, to get something going. Um, I suppose what I would comment personally uh, comment, uh, is uh, understanding at all moments scale and in the process of drawing that you've understood the importance of scale. So every drawing that we looked at there, there was always the reference to something in that sense measurable. Even it might be vast, we've seen cities drawn as we have here, um, we've seen sections through buildings, we've seen all kinds and manners of, of uh, places in, in that sense, but scale is always um, uh, a grounding. So understanding that, uh, I think, is something again that you've learned. It's not something that comes by accident. Um, so <coughs> I, I think, yeah, I think scale is, um, you know, if you recollect those Lebius wood drawings, I mean, they're absolutely incredible, and they're incredible because uh, simply because of those figures. I mean, the drawing is beautiful; it's lovely rendering, but it's you know, what gives it absolute meaning is those little figures in there. And what I try to do, you may have seen all the drawings, is I occupy that drawing. I occupy it literally with people. And if it's an abstract drawing, I occupy it with myself. And it's quite a difficult process, but I think that that really helps to um, articu uh, accelerate the process of articulation. I mean, I'm very fast. When I draw, I'm incredibly fast. And it's because I'm in the drawing. I don't, in many respects, I don't stop to, I don't actually, don't, often don't, when I did this drawing, I started in the bottom corner on a Saturday afternoon, I think it was, and I finished it on Sunday, at three hours, and I started again on Sunday in three hours, and reached the top of it, yeah, so. Yeah. I think uh, what, what's interesting is that uh, many of you are also in the drawing, and on Monday, we're going to have the pleasure of seeing your great exhibition of your year's work. So I think, um, it, it, and Bobby will be there as well, he'll be coming to enjoy it as well. So you're seeing him in the midst of a drawing, but you all, and those I'm f referring particularly to the foundation studio, but anyone else who's in the process of engaging with their studio challenge, you're, in the, you're, in, you're also in the drawing. So I think you can identify very clearly and directly with exactly where he is and where you are now. And would anyone like to comment on anything that they've produced uh, to get to this stage um, and what it's taken to get there? 
Um, or do we have to wait till Monday before we get to uh, see the exhibition? Anyone like to share anything? Any particular challenge? I've had a sneak preview already, and it's, I must say, very, very impressive. Like, uh, like usual, let me start. Uh, uh, first of all, this was far too overwhelming, and that's the reason probably the students are not being, they're still absorbing. And they're mentally it was prepared a for much more, but they didn't know. None of us knew what's coming and uh, hmm. thank you Bobby for this. Yeah, uh, you have mentioned many times, a uh, couple of times today uh, in your talk that uh, quick drawing, whatever thought process you have, it's very, very important. And you, you specifically mentioned quick hmm. in many of the hmm. examples. Uh, would you want to give a message uh, to the students here? that what you specifically mean by, because uh, one would question that the kind of quality which is there over the years, you would have uh, mastered it and that's the reason it looks like a finished mm. product, but how did you reach to that level mm. from your uh, mm. Kenya school days? Yeah, well it's, um, <coughs> I mean the simple answer is work, I mean it's hard, it's just labor. Um, I, uh, and uh, one, one of the <laughs> Which, which you're all doing incredibly well. I mean, it's, um, I think the realization, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important realization to be un, very unprecious about your drawings. I mean, it's been a nightmare for me to get this together because I don't have any of the drawings. And I, Ar Arunima's here somewhere, she helped me put this together. We've, I phoned all around the world and people will take photographs of a magazine. I don't have any of the stuff. Yeah, so this is all collated through. Um, so I think this being unprecious about it is, I think, really quite important. You know, and when you're unprecious about it, you're very happy to tear it up and start again. And I think that the the notion that you're that there's a search for this perfect solution, so you think you overthink it, you you're paralyzed to put the pen to paper, is a terrible condition that a lot of architects and designers have. Artists don't seem to have that, you know, because they are experimenting. And I think that, you know, as, uh, we're not artists, we're professionals, so we're very different. But I think that that approach to interrogating ideas quickly, fast, being unprecious, tear it up, start again, is, is, is what enables me to be very efficient when I draw. So the drawing is not the end. No, no. Uh, the drawing is never the end. The drawing is the process. Mm. And as we've seen through um, the simplest of, of, of vaguest of sketches through different mm. stages to actually a building. Mm. And even then the building is not the end, it's the functioning of the building. So mm. you're continually engaged in process. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, good. Here, but how do you value the term redo? Redo. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and now it's just two keys on a keyboard, right? <laughs> but that's another thing. But then the courage of of tearing something up yeah. uh, and actually doing it again. Is, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that this, I mean clearly the the engagement is here, and we're not. There's no pressure at all. But take it away with you. Uh, take this wonderful, wonderful uh, offering that he's given us with you, and see what you've done yourselves as part of this process. So. I think you've an awful lot to be uh, very satisfied by, and you've a huge amount to be challenged by. So I think there's a couple of stages. We may engage with and enjoy what you're doing, but know what's ahead of you, and know what in, the, in your hand, whether it's a pencil or whether it's a keyboard, that that is the vehicle of. So accept that you have ideas in your head. It's the, the language of drawing that will enable you to uh, bring that to another stage. So thank you, maybe, I think, let's, let's refresh ourselves, let's thank you. Yeah. 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 And as always, on your behalf, may I thank the team and the Foundation Studio for making this possible, for, the, for Ajit Bai and the team here for making all the buttons work and the lights go on and off, and to the volunteers who helped uh, organize this event. Thank you very much indeed, and look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you very much. You've got it.